Good evening, and welcome to our September lecture in our Understanding ADHD lecture series. I'm Kathy Essig from the Northern Virginia and DC chapter of CHAD, and tonight we're pleased to have Brendan Sheeran present the baffling IEP maze. Our chapter, CHAD of Northern Virginia and DC, is one of the many chapters in the CHAD National Organization, and as such, aligns with the national mission of improving the lives of those affected by ADHD. We're a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in a number of ways. In addition to offering this free monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months, we also have support groups for parents, students, and adults, and our annual resource fair that highlights ADHD Awareness Month and will begin with an in-person resource fair at the Vienna Community Center on October 7th from 9.30 to 12.30. You'll be able to grow your system of support by meeting with many practitioners who are experts in the field of ADHD. You'll also be able to hear our keynote speaker, Dr. William Stixrud, present Nurturing a Sense of Control in Kids with ADHD. Dr. Stixrud is a clinical neuropsychologist and founder of the Stixrud Group. He's also, also a nationally known speaker and the co-author of the books, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives, and What Do We Say? How to Talk to Your Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. We will then continue our month of celebrating ADHD awareness with three virtual lectures throughout the month. Our first lecturer will be Dr. Andrea Brenner on October 10th, speaking on how to adult transitioning from college to the great beyond. On October 17th, Dr. John Thomas will speak on ADHD in the workplace, finding the fit, the interface, and how to problem solve. And finally, on October 24th, Dr. Michelle Mullaly will speak on the importance of assessing and treating anxiety and trauma in understanding ADHD symptoms. All of the events are free and on Eventbrite, so we urge you to sign up and join us for a month of incredible information. While I said our chapter is run by volunteers, we cover other expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorship, and urge you to become a member. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Brendan Sharon. We would ask as Brendan is speaking that you place all of your questions in the chat and we will address them at the end of the meeting. Please mute yourself and turn off your video while we are presenting. Brendan will share these slides at the end of, after the, we will send them to all participants after the meeting. Brendan Sharon, is recently retired as an educator after 40 plus year career. He spent the bulk of his career at the Potomac School in McLean, Virginia, and credits the school as being the place where he grew both professionally and personally. He served as a teacher, as the Dean of Students, as the head of the, the Intermediate School, and was a member of the senior administrative team. He also served as chair of the Virginia Association of Independent Schools, and chair of the Professional and Diversity Committees. He founded the VAIS Independent School Teacher Institute in conjunction with the University of Richmond. Brendan took the opportunity of his departure from Potomac in 2008 to focus on small private schools challenged financially with the goal of making them sustainable in the long term. He held positions in Illinois, Michigan, and most recently Colorado before returning to Virginia to be nearer to his children, where he launched a nonprofit that's designed to support parents by helping them become their own best advocates and coaches for their struggling children. So Brendan, thank you so much for joining us and I will turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that warm uh, introduction. Uh, let me start off, you should all be seeing the little comic strip in front of you. And that's the first task is for you to be able to read it. Good luck with that. I spent several hours trying to make it so you could read the words, but it wasn't possible. So I have a 
a a paper copy of it here, and I'm going to read you the the ten the ten different squares. It's pretty simple. This is actually Amanda the Panda, and it's called "Stuck in a Maze" by James Price. And there's Amanda. We see her going to the maze, uh, and she's told, "Hey, don't forget your map. You might get lost without it." But Amanda doesn't listen. Instead, Amanda enters the maze, and very soon, by the third square, she's saying, hmm, haven't I already been here? And then by the fourth, she's saying, hello, there's a panda lost in this maze. And by the fifth, she's saying, now I wish I'd picked up that map. And then the good Samaritans come along, and they say to her, hey, Amanda, what's wrong? I can't find my way out of the maze, she says. I haven't got the map, the map to help me. We have a map. Why not tag along with us? And there they go, making their way through the maze successfully. Welcome to the IEP. So the purpose of today's presentation, as we look at it, is to help parents of ADHD kids specifically understand the medical, educational, legal aspects of the school IEP process, and also to encourage you as a parent to become your child's best advocate and coach. No one knows your child better than you do. And it's very important that you become the best advocate, the best coach for them. So as we go through the slides, um, you'll note that some of them are highlighted, some of them are not. And those are you know, the, the important areas that I'm going to discuss today. Some parts I won't discuss. They'll be there in the slides for you to look at. And really to see exactly how it is that we, like Amanda the Panda, can make our way through the maze. So as an introduction, three things. One, a reminder that your child is unique. Uh, there's only one person like your child uh, that is him or herself. This, it, this uh, presentation is a general presentation. So I will be saying things, some of which apply to your child, some of which may not apply to your child, uh, but apply to ADH children in general and to IEPs in general. So please, please bear with me as I go through those items. Secondly, you are at different stages inside the maze. Some of you haven't even reached the ticket office yet. Some of you are just entering the maze. Some of you are lost in the middle of the IEP maze. And there's some of you are, are successfully exiting the maze at least for one year, you hope. And then I want to tell my little 1995 Chad conference story about an ADHD child. Um, I went to a, ch a Chad conference. It was held uh, somewhere around Tyson's Corner. I can't remember where now. And there were various speakers one Saturday afternoon. And there was a woman in particular, a mother. And she told the story of her ADHD child. And what she did was she told it through three photographs. The first photograph was of him as a preschooler entering preschool on his first day. And you could just see how proud he was marching up those steps into the building. Unfortunately, his first day was also his last day because being an ADHD child, he did something impulsive that led to his being summarily dismissed from the school. So we go to on a few years, and her second photograph was of her ADHD child, and now he's 18. And he's literally standing in line in the big hall, waiting to graduate, to shake the hand of the head, and to walk off that stage after his long journey with ADHD uh, into the welcoming arms of his mother. He does not make it to the stage. Because, again, 
the ADHD mind, he does something compulsive and they kick him out of the proceedings. And he gets his, degree, his certificate later on, on his own, away from all the glitz and glamour. The third photograph, he's 35. And he is a fireman. And there is a lady who I take as his wife to his left. And he is holding what looks like a three, four, five-year-old little boy. And he's smiling. And he looks like a very happy, typical American family unit. So it is to say, as we begin this journey through these slides, don't give up. Keep hope alive. Be persistent. And eventually, your child and you will make it out of the maze. So ADHD, the IEP, it's a triad. And there are three parts of it that you really do need to understand as you go through this journey. One, ADHD is a medical diagnosis. It's not in itself a learning diagnosis. Uh, that is very different from many other of the diagnoses that they use in the schools to provide children with an IEP classification. It is also an academic classification. And it is also, very importantly, it is a legal classification. And those three, you need to have all three, an understanding of all three, in order, order to make this journey successfully. If you only understand one and don't understand the implications of the others, it's liable not to be successful. too far. So let's start with this. This is the bad news. This is what you see every day. And it was the best report I could find. It was 2014, and it came from an organization I'd never heard of called the National Library of Medicine. And they titled it the prevalence and characteristics of school services for high school students with ADHD. And Although it is focused on high school students, it really does, you know, it works for all students, K through 12. So looking at the Bolden bullets in particular, there's some really interesting information in that. Few ADHD students receive services outside of an IEP. The figure I've seen is at about 53% of ADHD students are receiving services because they have that IEP. And that's why you need to look at getting an IEP for your child. There are services, there are resources, there are protections for your child that unless he has that designation, he will not receive, she will not receive in school. 30% of ADHD students repeat a grade. This blew me away. Uh, repeating a grade may help support your child. I question that. So what we're saying here is last year, you pretty much failed at what you were doing because of your ADHD. So now we're going to do it all over again and nothing much is going to change. And we're not going to take into account the negative social impact of taking you out of your class and putting you back one. I've known kids. I have placed kids in a, a grade lower than the one that they started. And long term, it was actually to their academic benefit. But to this day, they will say they didn't appreciate it and that socially it was very much a negative. 56% received tutoring. Now, this is not the most important information, but I throw it out to you. So think of your, your ADHD child. Your ADHD child probably goes off to school each day saying, I'm stupid. They don't like me. All those things you hear uh, from kids when they're struggling. 
And so they go into school to do their math, to do their English, et cetera, et cetera. And they're banging their heads against the wall because they do not have the skills to help make them into a student. And so what do we do at night? Well, once they come home from school, we drive them to a very expensive tutor and we do the same again for another hour. And so, yes, we put the Band-Aid on it, which may help for a very short time, but we're not really helping because for most ADHD students, what they need are strong executive functioning tools. And unless they're organized, unless they have those tools that will help them uh, in their work, they are not going to succeed no matter how much tutoring. So it's a, it's a call to, to parents to stop wasting your money and focus it where it is actually going to make a difference. And here's the other one that bothers me a lot. More ADH students are placed in lower level classes. So remember that ADHD has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. ADHD ADHD um, is a medical diagnosis, and that we'll get to that momentarily, but it does not mean that you cannot be successful in school and that you are not intelligent. But still, because ADHD students are great at tripping over their own feet, we place them in lower level classes, we place them doing work that is way below what they're capable of doing, and our students suffer as a result. So what's a parent to do? The answer is simple. You need a parent master plan. You need, first of all, parent education. Start to educate yourself. You're doing that tonight, listening to this uh, webinar. You know, attend more chat meetings. Read a magazine like Attitude. I, Educate yourself on what ADHD is and what ADHD isn't. I hate to tell you this, but you need to learn about something called comorbidity. Because child, this is a condition that children with ADHD, approximately 20 to 30% of them also have another disability. Many times it's something like learning disabilities uh, or it is executive function, dysfunction. Uh, and so they are twice blessed and they're dealing with that. And you need to learn all about that. Number two, very importantly, build your own team of experts. You need people. You need to get the right people on the bus, your bus, your child's bus. And you need to get the wrong people off the bus. You need a doctor but you don't just need any old doctor. You need a developmental pediatrician. You need probably at some stage or other a therapist, particularly if social skills are involved. You need to have your family on board. You and your husband need to be, you and your husband, you and the child's father need to be in unity about the journey you're taking. Uh, you need grandma and grandpa to stop saying things like he'll grow out of it or you know, she's she's only a girl she'll get it eventually uh, you need their support you need the support of friends friends who aren't going to look at you as if you're the problem that you have created this problem through your parenting but who will understand that this is a disability and that your child needs their support. So build your own team of experts. The school has their team of experts. You need yours too. And then you need to get the wrong people off the bus. Anyone who is negative about your child, anyone who is negative about the things you're trying and the work you're doing for your child, throw them off the bus because you don't need them. You need support. And then as a parent, you know, the, the place where I always start with parents is parent know thyself. Parenting styles. You are a parent um, and you have a co-parent 
but you weren't brought up the same way with the uh, you know with the parenting styles and you learn a lot about parenting through how, how you watched your own parents parent you and so quite often there's a conflict there and then there's temperament remember you are born with an innate temperament it does not change from the moment you're born you have it to the moment you die so you have won the child's father has won and the child himself is one. So anything you try to do, anything you try to plan, you have to all be able to negotiate and navigate these parenting styles and temperament. So let's get to the medical process. Before you even get to the school, you have to talk. Whoops, I lost that. Sorry. Before you even get to the medical part, you need to... Uh, sorry, to the school part, you need to talk to a doctor. And the medical process of your child being uh, diagnosed with ADHD is a very strange process because it really is a subjective diagnosis. What they do is they will give you a form, three or four forms, one's for the teacher, one's for dad, one's for mom, one's for someone else, maybe one's for the child, and you'll be asked to fill in all these questions. And based on that, your child will be diagnosed with or without ADHD. There's no blood test. There's no scans involved. That's it. So before you actually get to that point, what you have to do is make sure your child has a general health assessment. Uh, yeah, a little more than the sort of summer thing you get at the start of each year. This, and particularly, I urge you to look at vision and hearing because a lot of times the symptoms that you see with ADHD kids can be found in kids dealing with other issues as well. And so you need to make sure that it really, you really think it's an ADHD issue uh, and to exclude those other things before you start. As I said, you must have a, pe a de developmental pediatrician. Even now, I hear from parents stories that their pediatrician basically says those same old things. He'll grow out of it. Yeah, um, he's only a boy. And a lot of of doctors do not have a background in ADHD and in special ed in general. So you need one that does. Uh, and I suggest to you, you write the letter, you arrange for an interview, and when you arrive, you have a list of questions, and eventually that list will include discussion about medications, which I'm not going to discuss here tonight. So. The big question to ask halfway done, number five here is, do you provide both behavioral and medical treatments? So once you're at the doctor, once you've done due diligence there, once it's been confirmed by someone who just doesn't rush in and say, oh yeah, ADHD, but who takes the time to talk to you and to really develop that diagnosis, only then, number six, is it time to approach the school? And you're on much firmer ground when you have that medical diagnosis about seeking the IEP assessment than without it. Without it, you will go nowhere. Without it, um, they would may provide you some services, but it, it may be hit and miss. Which brings us to, well, what services? What is an IEP? Well, it starts with something called IDEA. An IDEA is the Individual with Disabilities Education Plan Act. Sorry, I should have wrote Act there. Um, and, that, and that is the law. Very important that you understand this. That is the law which protects your child with ADHD, and that is the law which provides him with extra appropriate supports and resources in school. And there's six pillars to it. One, it's free. It's part of the public system, although it's not 
part of necessarily part of the private systems of schools. They do not have to necessarily abide by all the laws. Um, but you have to provide that ADHD child with the, what's called the least restrictive environment. You cannot tuck that child away somewhere and lock them in, in a room and say, get on with it. You have to basically, as much as you possibly can, that child should be in a mainstream room. Number four is really important. This law says very, very clearly that you as the parent are a full full and active member of the IEP team. I repeat that. You have as much power in that IEP team as the head does, the head of school, the principal. You have as much power as the special education teacher has. And you must be given that understanding. You must be allowed to be heard in that. It is hugely important that you be involved in that. And number five, there are all sorts of procedural safeguards. They go on and on for volumes to protect that, to ensure that your rights and your child's rights are protected. There's also something called a 504 Rehabilitation Act, which we'll also get to. And that's sort of like an IEP light. And we'll get to that in a little while. So the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, um, it, there, these are the main things that it requires um, if you apply for an IEP for your child. So you've got your IEP, you've got your ADHD diagnosis. You go to the school, you say, my child has ADHD. We would like some more supports and resources. That starts the clock ticking. The moment that happens, uh, there's a timeline that is written in the act. And each state is a little different. But in Virginia, it says within 30 days, business days of the referral, six weeks. School has six weeks to begin the process, to screen the child, to write a written evaluation report, and to hold the IEP meeting, and to come up with a list of suggestions. 30 days, and that's very, very clear. Also, it talks about the mission of the IEP team. The IEP is the cornerstone um, of this process. And as it says there, the second bullet at the bottom, the IEP creates the opportunity for teachers, parents, administrators, and if appropriate, your child too to work together to improve educational results for the student with disabilities, including ADHD. Uh, you must take that opportunity as a parent. The Individual Disabilities Act also is very clear about who's on that IEP team. If you go to a meeting, there'll probably be six to eight people in front of you. And it'll include the teacher of the child, the special education teacher, probably the head or the assistant head, someone who has interpreted the evaluation results, and you, top bullet, you, the child's parent, parents, with full team rights. I cannot emphasize this enough, how important that is. Um, note the second from the end. Other individuals who have knowledge of the child. Maybe you'll invite the kid's doctor, and if luck, uh, the child's doctor will go too. Maybe it's an advocate. Maybe it's grandmother. Maybe it's someone else who works with your child in, someone, in some other capacity. But you have the right to invite someone to that meeting. And I always say, make use of that right. It is very, very important. So what is the I idea require the IEP team to consider? First of all, the strengths of your child. It's not all about weaknesses. Every child has promised. I'll repeat that. Every child has promised. And maybe the school teachers are seeing weaknesses, and it's up to you to show them the strengths as well um, it, within the IEP report. 
It'll also have the results of the evaluation. It'll be discussed for a while. And it'll also discuss the child's needs. A, should behavior be included in that IEP? I would say to you, absolutely. Remember the impulsive child who got expelled from school? ADHD kids are by nature impulsive, usually at some stage. It is very important that they be protected from themselves, from that impulsivity, which may lead them to engage in a behavior which is frowned upon by the school. I would suggest to you that the only way really to protect your child is to have behavior included in the IEP so that there are goals set up to try to ensure that the impulsivity, which may lead to difficulty, is avoided as much as possible. So what's your role in the IEP process? I would argue to you that you need to go in there and be very clear about your goals. What is it you want? What are your priorities for your child? Just saying, I want my child to improve and get better grades doesn't cut it. Uh, what does that mean? You need to be very specific and clear. Parents, do not rush into accepting the recommendations that are presented to you at a meeting. They will, the, the team, the IP team, the school will eventually present you with an IP draft. In Fer, if you're in Fairfax County, every one of them says at the top draft IEP. I have a problem with that, but that's for another day. Um, do not rush into accepting that recommendation. Do not sign anything other than the attendance form, which everyone signs. You would not do anything major in your life. You would not buy a house without reading the report first. Don't do that with your child's IEP. Because when you go into that IEP, you are faced with people who know each other, people who are talking over each other with ideas, and you're there and they're, they're using all sorts of acronyms. Uh, you're sort of stuck in the middle, unsure and probably a little timid. You need to go home and slowly digest that. And the law gives you time to do that. It is not it does not become active until it's signed by the parent. Do not go alone. As I said, you're surrounded by teachers and other professionals. There is a lot of ideas being thrown out there. You need someone to, at the very least, be writing down some points of the meeting. Should you tape record the meeting? Not unless trust is totally broken down. If trust, there's no trust at the meeting, then it may be a reason to tape record it. Otherwise, you need to show the other side that you're looking to build a team you trust them to. Sometimes they say, well, we can't do that. We don't, we don't do that here. To which I love the phrase, well, show us the specific written policy regulation. Come on, just show it to us, and uh, then we'll all know what it is. And if they can't show it to you, then there's absolutely no reason why they can't do it. Ensure that your agenda is discussed. The very first thing will happen in such a meeting is they will distribute the agenda for the meeting that they have created. And there's nothing wrong with that agenda, but it may not include the points that you want to discuss. And that's very important that you get to have your say about items that are not on the agenda. So go with your agenda, share it with them, and make sure that all your questions and all your ideas and all your suggestions are discussed and acted on, either for or against. The parent agenda sheet. Begin with your child's strength, as I say. Put a face to the child they're discussing. They don't know. Some of them will know your child, but not all of them. Some of them will just be fleeting. Um, 
Make sure they understand your child's struggles and your child's concerns. This idea that I'm stupid. No one likes me. Require the use, and this is very important, this number four here, require the use of SMART goals. What are SMART goals? Well, they're, behind, they're underneath there. Um, goals, they may say, in a, and I've seen this a number of times, they will say, they will have written down, Jimmy um, will improve in mathematics. Okay. That's like saying, that I am going to become an NBA basketballer you know, in the next few months. What does it mean? Absolutely nothing. What you have to do is pin each goal down. Be specific. Jimmy is going to become a better math student by doing these three things over and over. And then... While he's doing them, we are going to measure it. We are going to write down the number of times that he actually achieves this and when he achieves it and when he doesn't achieve it. Jimmy is asked to stay in his chair and he manages to do it on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Well, what's going on on Tuesdays and Thursdays? It doesn't happen. It gives us information to work with. The goal must be attainable. I'm going to regrow my hair is not attainable. It has to be a goal that's attainable and it has to be relevant to the child. And then most importantly, perhaps, it has to be time limited. When is this going to be done by? Well, by the time he's 16. What does that mean? It doesn't mean a thing. Within the next two months by this date, we are going to reevaluate based on the measurements that we um, gather in regard to the specific goals. They are vitally important. And if they're not doing that in the IP, and generally they don't, it's not good enough. And you can call them on it and require it. Um, very important that you may, that you get used to asking for things for your child. So you've gone and you've asked for the IEP. They've tested your child. You've had the meeting. And there are three potential outcomes. One, your child is found eligible for accommodations, uh, which would be great. Uh, two, that he's found el eligible for modifications. And three, that he's not found eligible. And maybe we get to that IEP like the 504 instead. There are 13 different categories that your child can be assessed in, can fall under for eligibility for IEP services. Some of them are obvious, like a, ch a child that's blind or a child that's deaf. ADHD, because it's subjective, because it can't be measured in a test, the best you hope for is that it falls under something called other health impairment category, and which is impacting your child's experience unless uh, comorbidity is found of something else, like your ADHD child also has autism or something like that. So what's the difference between accommodations and modifications? Accommodations change how a student learns the material. So maybe he gets longer in taking a test. Maybe he gets to sit at a preferential seat. Maybe he gets an extra break, but he's still doing the same math questions as everyone else. Modifications change what a student is taught or is expected to learn. Maybe he's not expected to do a foreign language. And um, that's a very big difference between the two. So your child has been final eligible. And as I said, things like extra time, uh, special seating arrangement, use of discrete fidgets, use of technology, which we could get into, um, help with emotional regulation, such as outbursts and things like that. These are generally um, a, a quiet place in which to take tests. These are generally the sort of um, supports 
that your ADHD child gets. And you should work with your team to prioritize which comes first. Which ones are you really going to work on here? And we'll get to that in a second. Find eligible with modifications. Unusual, but as I said, likely to happen in conjunction with something like if the child has autism or blindness or something else like that. Find ineligible. Well, what they're saying is your child, we uh, tested your child, we screened your child, and he didn't reach the bar in any of the 13 categories. There is an appeal process you can use. And what they're most likely to say is, yes, there are areas we may support him. Um, and there's something called a 504. I call the 504 the fuzzy plan because it doesn't have to be written and it's often driven by the school, not by the parents. Uh, they say, well, we're going to give you extra supports. But again, smart goals. Is it specific? How long is it going to be for each day? Who's going to give the support and so forth? Um, so that's why it's it may be enough for your child. It may be what they need. Um, but be prepared for that and to discuss that. The transition IEP. If your child is over 16, and I'm actually working with a child who's actually 14 and just going into ninth grade, there's something for it called a transition IEP. And the parent and the child should be part of this team. And it discusses basically whether your child is going down a diploma or certificate track. And this applies largely to kids who have been found with a challenge and different forms of challenges and who basically are not succeeding in school. They're just not succeeding in school. So the school looks at developing, wants to know, is he really going down an academic track or are we looking more certificate track, which may be more appropriate? And again, that all depends on the individual child. So congratulations. You've got your IP. You're through the IP. The, your child has been offered accommodations of various sorts. You go home. You think it's all done and dusted. And then you find there's problems. Uh, there's problems with lack of clarity. I, well, who exactly is going to do what here? And how many minutes is my child going to get help with this each week? Or, or is it going to be in a group or is it going to be individual? All these things uh, offer difficulties for the family. And it means you have to go back in, develop the relationship with the teacher in the classroom or teachers and talk to them about what is what. You may have to go back in and call for another IEP meeting which you can do as a full member of the team. It just depends. I would start with trying to fix it in the classroom first. And it's only if it's really clear that you're beating your head against the wall that then you move on to the IEP. So the IEP execution, every stakeholder in it has responsibility. As a parent, you have responsibilities. It does not all fall on the backs of the school. You need to be monitoring the progress in the school. You need to create the optimum homework environment and structure for your child to be successful. If your child is going out every night and sitting on the bleachers while his younger sister practices her dance movements and he's doing his homework there, it's not going to work. And um, you have to have a structure and a plan in place and keep to it each and every night. The child has a responsibility. And I have seen both here uh, over the years, the child that buys into, yes, I have ADHD. That's me they're talking about. And then tries to work on the goals um, to improve and generally can. Uh, and then there's a the child who will try to sweep it under the carpet and that and will not take advantage of the resources being offered. And that does not work. And then and the school has the responsibility to execute the IEP as agreed. 
So stakeholders, why do schools complain about parents, IEP parents? Well, the parents too emotional. Um, the parents not professional enough in dealing about their child. The parent that comes unprepared for meetings has no clue basically why they're there or just doesn't show up. The parents who does not fully recognize the child's challenges tries to you know, blow off uh, some of these challenges when they can be quite serious or the parent that devalues the expertise of the teachers. No one knows your child better than you. No one knows children and childhood better than the teachers who have taught hundreds and thousands of them. Parent complaints about schools. You talk too much about my son's deficits. You don't talk enough about his strengths. Sorry, I lost you there. Where am I going here? One, two. Uh, hold on one second, please. I'm about three ahead of where I need to. We're getting to the end. Uh, uh, parent complaints about schools. They focus on the, my child's deficits. Talk about my child's strengths. Do you know that she's a wonderful artist? Do you know that she goes off horseback riding at the weekend? Do you know that little kids love her? Uh, and the, prior, the school may prioritize the needs of the school over the needs of the child. We can't do that because we don't have the resources. If you hear that, then your answer is tough. You know, find the money because I the uh, idea law says you have to meet my child's needs. Where you get the money, that's up to the school. Sometimes teachers have a bad attitude about kids with IEPs. And sometimes, I've lost it again, um, they simply failed to follow the IEP. Some teachers are great at being passive aggressive, and you have to watch out for that. Poor communication from the school. This drives me crazy. This is such an easy one to fix. Your child does something or doesn't do something. And the school, rather than calling you, um, does not communicate to you what they need from your child. And it's only later on that you find out that your child is in a hole and is digging himself further into it. Um, Parents also complain that they don't provide enough options for the child's growth beyond doing what most kids are doing. Well, are there opportunities for them for to be doing little leadership things? Can they take the third grader? Can he take the attendance in the morning? Can, you know, that sort of thing, little things that will just help your child feel better. And then, very importantly, um, inappropriate discipline strategies. Your child, um, well, they don't look at the, ch the, the child involved in the incident. They look at the incident. They don't look at what led up to it and so forth. And just a little more thought given to the disciplinary strategies would be so helpful to both school and families. Almost finished. Goals. Okay, so you're in the IEP and you ask for six golds and they say, sure, this is giveaway golds day. So here they are. Your child, who remember has likely been dealing with this ADHD issue and maybe other issues um, since birth. And now here we are, we're 12 years of age and we're in sixth grade uh, or seventh grade. And now you're asking me, to improve in not one area, but in six areas. It doesn't work. You have to do it one at a time. You have to prioritize with the parents, with the family, with the child, prioritize one at a time. And if there's one in particular that I would hold out to you, it is the executive functioning issue, the child that is totally disorganized because it impacts not just his life in school, but his life at home as well. Work with the teachers, focus on one or two goals at a time, keep your expectations reasonable, and remember that Rome was not built in a day. So my advice to you, the IEP process is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm working with a kindergarten 
autistic boy at the moment and his IEP. And I keep mentioning to mom that, yes, it's okay to be upset with the school, uh, but you really need to build a relationship with this school over a period of 12, 13 years. And it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Choose your battles. Build that relationship with the school. That's hugely important. And um, be on the same page as parents. And then my favorite, love the child you have. Unless you're going to give up your child and replace him with a hamster, this is the child you have. The ADHD child is a wonderful child is a very funny child, is a very smart child, is a very creative child, is a very annoying child, but he's yours. And he's yours to have and to hold and to enjoy. As I always said to parents, you only have a 12-year-old once. Next year, he's 13, and you'll never have that 12-year-old again. Enjoy your child while you have him. And then... I wish you could see me, but I threw out a big hand. My hand's in the air. I threw out a big hand to you as parents. Um, it is exhausting what you're doing. And most of you have probably got more than one child. Most of you are trying to hold down a job. Or maybe it's an older parent that you're dealing with as well. And all these things are going on in your life, and yet you're giving up time, and you're giving up money, and you're giving up your resources to support this child. And it will work to some degree or other for you if you hang in there long enough. But you have to hang in because you probably won't see the full results until long after the child's out of school. And as the father of three children who were all diagnosed with ADHD, one of them incorrectly, let me tell you, they still have their ADHD, but they're dealing with it. They're managing it. They're controlling it. And they are in a much better place. So I give you a big hand. And finally, there I am. <laughs> there I am. Yes, you thought I looked very differently, didn't you? Um, IEP Parenting Virginia, we are a nonprofit. The only work I do is with parents in helping them through this process. I don't do tutoring. I don't, I don't work with your child. Uh, I just work with the parents. And it's very fulfilling because of the parents that I meet who are helping their child. And uh, yeah, my, if you, sorry, having watched this presentation, if you have a question I haven't answered or you don't get answered, just give me a call. I'll answer it for you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll look into it for you. So thank you very much for being here. It must have been a slow night on Netflix or something. But uh, or it could be just because you are 100 percent committed to your to your child. And I honor you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brendan. I'm Cheryl Gedzelman. Um, I thought that was extremely informative and I, I'm sure everybody learned a lot of information. I'm going to monitor some of the questions and answers from the chat box. Um, the first question is, is there any way to monitor that accommodations are actually happening if my child isn't willing or able to tell me? Uh, yes. Um, the best way is to get involved with the school, is to volunteer if you can, if you, yeah, if you are, um, you know, have the time to, from work to volunteer, go into the classroom and you'll see some of the things that are going on. The other thing is to remember the goals. If you have set up four or five smart goals, you should be able to know through quizzes and tests and the child's work that's coming home at night, you should be able to at least get a general idea of what's going on. 
Uh, and then simply ask the teacher as well. Get that feedback. So I have some parents who are getting weekly feedback from the teacher without overburdening the teacher. And if you can do that, that's great. Uh, if you find that you think the goals aren't working, then absolutely call another IEP meeting and look at the goals again, revise them, amend them, and move on from there. Okay, but sorry, it largely falls on your shoulders. Okay, very good. Um, the next question is, I have an advocate and I'm still overwhelmed on how to monitor progress, specifically with orthographic processing. That's the whole question. Um, okay. I to monitor, monitor uh, progress um, with orthographic <clears throat> processing. I, yeah. Well, I yeah, I am an advocate. I'm, all advocates are a little different in what they do. I am. This largely is similar to the first question in that you really, it, it, it is going, unless you set it up for the advocate to do that and he needs to get per, full permission from the school and so forth and so forth. Um, but it's not impossible. If you want someone else to monitor this, then it is possible. The schools will him and ha, but it's possible. Um, but again, I think that for most people, the burden is going to fall on the family. And you just always have to be watching and listening for what's going on. Okay. Um, the next question, um, somebody pointed out that it's incredibly common to have to wait at least six months to get in with a developmental pediatrician. Um, so what, what do we do? Um, <laughs> Yeah, knowing myself and um, my own doctor that uh, just how long it takes to get in to see them sometimes, but I think we are all suffering with that medical issue. I think if you find if someone says six months, then you just have to keep searching. Maybe uh, you have to go outside the area. If you live in, for example, Fairfax, maybe you have to go into D.C. or maybe you have to go into Maryland, whatever but you have to just keep searching for that developmental pa pediatrician. It is well worth the search. You will not regret it. Okay, thank you. If one, another question, if the child is an older teen and growing out of the pediatrician age group, what doctor would be appropriate? And is an ADHD? Um, sorry, say that. That well, last bit again. First question is what doctor would be appropriate after aging out of the pediatrician? And the second question from the same person is an ADHD coach appropriate? Okay. Um, well, my question to the last part is when you say an ADHD coach, are you talking for the child? And I are talking about for the child, and I think you are. And I would say finding the right ADHD coach to supplement the coaching you're doing. It's like everything else. When I had kids, they would enter seventh grade. And by then, there was no way on earth they were going to have their mother sitting with them at the kitchen table doing math. And the best solution was a tutor. Take out all the emotion from that. And it's the same with having a, an ADHD coach. If there's emotion involved, remove the parent. It's that simple. Sorry, parents. Um, but again, look for the right one. Ask lots of good questions. Uh, because there are a million people out there um, offering services that they are not qualified to provide. And sorry, remember, an advocate or a coach doesn't need a license. So you can you know, set out your shingle at any time you want. Right. So you have to be using due diligence when choosing due diligence. a coach. Um, somebody recommended that um, since the wait would be so long to get, I think, to get a, a developmental pediatrician, I think that's what they're talking about, that they recommended to call frequently to find out if they're last minute consolations 
or see if they maintain a last minute cancellation, cancellation list. Um, the same person said, we got our child into the autism clinic at Kennedy Krieger after three to four months on the last minute list. Otherwise it would have been a two year wait. So that's good advice. And I don't see any more questions on the chat. Does anyone else have a question they wanna add? We can wait a few minutes. Um, I will say, sorry, two last pieces of wisdom. Uh, one is trust but verify everything that the school says. And two, there's a guy called Wright, and he's written a number of books about the IP process and special ed law and so forth. He's, he's basically the guru that people go to. And he always he always says, if it's not written, it wasn't said. So someone might make you a promise that your child is going to have A, B, C, and D. But unless it's in that IEP, it won't necessarily happen. So always, always have things written. And I also encourage parents not to communicate so much by phone with the school, but to do it through email as much as possible, because then you have a record. And a record speaks. Remember, this is a legal process too. But also remember that everything that is in writing is never completely private. So be careful. Um, the next question is, can you explain more about how to handle the behavioral part by IEP? Um, it's it's pretty much like any other part of it. If you're asking for another uh, accommodation, uh, for your child, um, if you're looking at the behavior part in an IEP, it's well specifically with ADHD children. We know they're impulsive, and so they are liable to do something impulsive at some stage, and that may or be not seen as being something serious in a school setting. There, there's very much, sad to say, there's very much a zero tolerance for anything that's seen as misbehavior or worse these days in schools. We understand why, but you know, it, it's not looking at the person, it's not looking at the incident through the lens of the person. Uh, so you have it, something specific to that kid. And, so maybe once he's got a warning and then it happens again and uh, someone calls you, you get the call to come in and talk to them and they say, you know, this reaches the level and there's a code for it. I forget what the code is, a long code. It reaches the level of this and that's going to go in your child's file. And uh, uh, Or it reaches this level. And that's going to go in your child's file. And then it happens for a third time. Well, then what happens? Well, then maybe the discussion becomes, well, you know, um, your child just, you know, a, this is problematic within the setting, uh, the behavior of your child. If you have an IEP, then the school, and it includes behavioral goals, then the school must look at revising and amending the IEP to keep, to work on it, in other words, to keep working on the behavior to ensure that it stops. They cannot just say, you know, three strikes and you're out. There is a protection that the IEP offers. And that's why I always say to parents, get something about behavior. If it's appropriate, get something about behavior. If you think there's any chance, knowing your child at home, knowing your child out in the community, knowing your child in school, if there's any chance that there may be a behavioral issue down the road. Okay, there's a follow-up question. Is it a a law to include behavioral in IEP. Uh, sorry, would you say that one more time? Is it required that behavioral 
um, issues are included in an IEP or is it optional? Absolutely not. It is not required, period. And you may have a child who's, you know, the best child in the world. And the idea, it, it may not be impulsive. Yeah, it may not be the hypertivity. Hyperactivity may be such that it's really not an issue. The impulsivity is not an issue. Then no. But if you find down the road that something happens, have them talk to them about revising the uh, IEP to include that in some way. Okay. Um, the next question. Have you ever known a school to provide, the school to provide an ADHD coach? By an ADHD coach, I'm thinking executive function coach. Um, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's what this person means. But that's well, what every mean. school, every school has a special education department and special education resources of one form or another. And most schools have programs. I, I mentioned the little boy who's getting 12, 14, is going into ninth grade. While he was in middle school, he was undergoing a program which was designed specifically to improve some of the deficits in learning that he had. And it wasn't improve his French, it was improve the skills base and Harry went about being a student. So they all have programs and um, executive functioning skills will fall under that in some way or other. However, the question is, again, smart goals. Uh, what does that mean as a program? How often is my child going to it? Is he on his own or is he in a group? What exactly is the curriculum in this? And, you know, there's a whole lot. You just, again, trust but verify. Or I, you know, looking at tutoring, you heard me disparage tutors earlier. Um, it, executive functioning coaching is a place where your money is very well spent if it's done properly. That because that person uh, can do two things. One, they can help your child set up his his or her nighttime routine, making sure that they have all the resources and the books and doing the time management, et cetera, et cetera. They can develop a plan, a program, which does all that and takes it, breaks it down into step by step by step. Uh, my wife, uh, who works in special education, one time she did a thing uh, whereby she said to me, she said, do you know how many steps there are in brushing your teeth? I said, no. And she had some enormous number, like 54, which started with picking up the toothbrush and then putting the toothpaste on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is with kids who lack executive functioning. They do not have the organizational skills and you have to break it into a million little pieces and build on those one at a time. And so a coach uh, who does that is wonderful, is gold is gold because a lot of that can then be transferred in the school as well. Okay, so, somebody asked, what are your thoughts about asking for a coach at the school? I, I think some, some schools do provide uh, something like that, some don't, what do you think? Uh, the answer is, is some do, some may, some may not. I don't know of any school that does as such beyond what I said, offering you know, what we're offering every other kid as well. Um, the under idea, under the law idea, idea lays out very clearly what the school has to pay for. For example, the school has to pay for, for um the report, the school has to pay for this or for that or the other. It does not mention anywhere that beyond what they offer through their faculty, that school has to offer parents specific help and pay for it. They might help them find it, 
but they won't pay for it directly. You may be able to get somehow or other, find somewhere other road down that you know that path, but they won't pay for it directly, and it's not part of the idea law. Right, I know that's true, but actually, I knew somebody who had a coach at a school that was provided, and it was middle school. It was because the teachers were volunteering in their extra. That's time great. To work with kids. It was a really that's nice wonderful. Day. So yep. maybe you can see what's available at the school. It, it probably could, it's, you never know what they could offer. Um, are there any other questions? Cause that was the last one. So we're going to say thank you very much on behalf of the Chad board of directors for giving this very informative talk. And like Pam said at the beginning, this, the slides will be available afterwards. And I know some, some people signed up and didn't come because they know they could watch it afterwards because it's been recorded. So thank you very much and take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody.